Welcome to this bonus episode of the Fertility Podcast, which is quite an unusual episode in that I'm going to be sharing with you a webinar that I hosted for the Being Human Festival, which was a humanities festival that happened in November at Queen Mary University London. And it was a really fascinating conversation with a panel of scientists, artists, sociologists talking about visions of re- of reproduction. And it's quite long, so I'm keeping my intro short. Just to say that the Fertility Podcast is relaunching. We'll be back with you on the 22nd of February, so do make sure you've subscribed via your favourite podcast app. And of course, you can follow me at Fertility Body and Kate at Your Fertility Journey on your socials. And I'll put all our details at the end as well, so you can get in touch. Enjoy this. A very good evening and welcome to what is going to be a fascinating event this evening. Visions of Reproduction, the Making and Meaning of Reproductive Imaging. My name is Natalie Silverman. I'm a former fertility patient. My son was born in 2015 after we had successful IVF treatment. And once pregnant, I launched the Fertility Podcast, which I've been making for the last six years. And it's all about empowering you and educating you in your next steps in your fertility. I speak to a whole host of experts as well as individuals who share their stories and have got almost 300 episodes. So if you're a podcast fan, you can dive in and hopefully find something of interest. And I'm really pleased to be involved with this event, which is part of the National Being Human Festival of the Humanities, taking place across the UK between 12th and the 22nd of November. Being Human is the only national festival of the humanities run by the School of Advanced Study, University of London, in partnership with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and British Academy. You can see the full programme online at beinghumanfestival.org. And the festival can be found at Being Human Fest on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. The hashtag is being human 2020 so we'd love it if you share your involvement you can take pictures of the zoom screen which i know has been lots of what we've shared during this time also do help us to keep as many festival events as possible free and to improve the festival in years to come by taking a moment to fill in a feedback survey because your feedback is so valuable to us so thank you in advance for that and finally if you'd like to support the festival by making a donation please go to beinghumanfestival.org forward slash support hyphen us. So this event is organised by the research group Remaking the Human Body, led by Manuela Perotta, and based at the Department of People and Organisations at the Queen Mary University of London. Now, unfortunately, Manuela can't join us today. The event is funded by the Wellcome Trust and is held in partnership with the Fertility Podcast. And one thing that is really important to highlight before we begin is that we are going to be talking about pregnancy, pregnancy loss, feeling pregnant when you're not, and miscarriage. And we're also going to be showing images of embryos, fetuses, and pregnancy tests and false pregnancy symptoms. And we're very aware that these can all be triggering. So please do have a think about your own personal circumstances before we begin. So the event is organized as follows. Each of our speakers are going to give a short presentation about 10 minutes each, and then they'll have the chance to reflect upon ideas that come up. They'll be answering questions from the audience. So you will be able to make comments and ask questions throughout the whole duration of the event in the chat but your questions will be asked to the speakers at the end in our Q&A session. So there will be five questions in total, and these are really important for us to understand how we might adapt future events. And they're simple questions, so do feel free to answer them as soon as they appear. So if you open the link, you'll see that there is a first question for you to answer. And I'm gonna give you a few moments to answer the following question. Could you list three images about infertility, conception, or pregnancy that you have come across? Pregnancy test, fetus, okay, no, yeah, pregnancy tests, eggs and sperms, ultrasounds, scan photos, drawings of fallopian tubes, placentas, embryo and petri dish, pregnancy books, really brilliant variety. Beyonce's Instagram announcements. (laughs) Now, that was an image, wasn't it? Bumps, 
fertility clinic ads, 3D scans, there's so many. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna have more questions which will be popping up and um, we really encourage you to get involved. So we are here today to hear and discuss about the history and current use of imaging in the field of fertility and reproduction, focusing in particular on visualizations of embryos, reproductive bodies, organs and processes. And how we're going to do that is with a great panel of sociologists, historians and artists who are each going to present their work around these themes and resonate together about the social life of images, the making of images and the role of visualization in reproduction. So the amazing speakers that will contribute to this conversation are Dr. Josie Hamper, who's a postdoctoral researcher and involved in the remaking of the Human Body Project at Queen Mary University of London. And Josie is leader of the Wellcome Trust Project and the grant that is at the basis of this event. We're going to hear from Tabitha Moses, who's an artist, Dr. Isabel Davis from Birkbeck University, Liv Pennington, also an artist, and Professor Nick Hopwood from the University of Cambridge. Our first speaker is Dr. Josie Hamper, who was involved in the research, looking at the variety of ways reproductive imagery is made available to people going through their treatment and the emotional impact it has on people. Hello, thank you for the introduction, Natalie. I'm Josie. I'm a researcher on the Re Making the Human Body Project, which is led by Manuela Perotta, um, who unfortunately can't join us today, but she'll be with us for future events. In my 10 minutes, I thought I would talk about the focus of the research project on the role of imagery for fertility professionals and patients. Um, and I'm also going to talk through some highlights from the project so far. So first of all, I'm going to try and engage you, the audience, again, um, in a very short test. So you'll see an image on the screen now, hopefully, um, and I want you to tell me what you see in this image via a question that will appear in a couple of seconds. So there will be eight options, and I want you to select one of these. Okay, so the question has come up here now, so I'll give you just a couple of moments um, to read through those and uh, select one of those answers. Quite a few people saying an eight cell embryo, a human embryo. I don't know. It's quite a few people saying they don't know. Okay, so quite a diverse response, I think, but mostly an eight cell embryo. So I've added the caption to the picture. Um, this is from the Wellcome Trust's online collection and the title of the picture is Human Eight Cell Embryo for IVF Selection. Some of you will probably have figured all of the answers provided and many more potentially are correct. This is a picture of a human embryo, more specifically um, an embryo created through IVF. It is an eight cell embryo, so probably around day three of its development in the lab. And for embryologists who assess this type of an imagery, this is a grade one embryo, or that's what I'm told anyway, I'm not um, a grading expert, uh, which um, but also for, for people who are going through um, IVF, this could be a, a representation of a potential baby or even a baby's first picture. So the point being that the same Im image is something different uh, for different people. And in our research, we're interested in all sorts of images that people use or encounter as part of IVF, but we're particularly interested in a relatively new innovation that makes short videos uh, like the one that I'm going to play on screen now. Um, so this is a video of an embryo that's made using time lapse technology, which in the context of IVF means that um, a microscope and a camera are embedded into an incubator that takes photos about every 10 or 20 minutes usually. And then these photos are stitched together um, to make this kind of short video that shows the embryo developing over time. So without this tool, the embryologist uh, has to manually take the embryos out of the incubator to observe them under the microscope but with it uh, embryos can be watched without actually having to be moved. So in our research we're interested in finding out what consequences um, what the consequences of this new technology are both within and outside IVF labs. And to answer this question my colleagues have spent many many hours um, watching and observing how time lapse is used by embryologists in IVF clinics across um, England and across the whole research team we've interviewed over 100 people uh, about their um, 
their perspectives or their use of this type of imagery, including IVF professionals, so embryologists and other fertility specialists, as well as patients and partners who are going through IVF and who might be shown this type of imagery. Um, and often when new technologies are introduced, there's a tendency to focus on the ways in which they are potentially revolutionary uh, and how they could really change how things are done. But we're also interested in the much more subtle changes that can take place. So, for example, time lapse imaging of embryos has given much more detailed visual and uh, temporal information about embryo development, which has not um, been available before in the same way. But the videos can also be used to share new kinds of information in new ways uh, with patients. So there are two sort of aspects to the study that we're working on. Okay, so my um, particular focus within this broader research project has been on the experiences of IVF patients and partners. And I want to spend the rest of my minutes um, talking through some of the things that came out or came up in these interviews. Um, so first of all, it's worth mentioning that there's no one way of sharing images or videos of embryos uh, with patients. So we found that some clinics would give the video on a USB stick so um, patients could take them home and watch them in private. Others um, sent the video via the patient's online portal um, and others showed the video during consultations at the clinic. And of course, others never got to see this kind of moving imagery at all. So it really did uh, vary depending on the clinic. And at first, patients generally expressed a real feeling of excitement about seeing this video. They often talked about it um, in terms of being amazed by the science of IVF. And uh, they were really in awe of the, the level of detail that they were able to see. But many um, also explained how seeing the videos of their embryos could actually create new uncertainties, particularly because they felt unsure about what it was that they were actually watching. So a number of patients told me that they had gone home um, and actually sort of tried to do some research about their video, gone on Google to look up other people's videos and then try to compare them. Um, so sort of, yeah, um, that could be quite sort of difficult. Um, and patients would question, is this embryo good quality? Is it supposed to be dividing like this? Is that a good or a bad sign? How does this compare to em other embryos? And they would have lots of, uh, sometimes having this video would, would actually raise more questions. Some patients and partners were quite ambivalent about receiving the video, questioning why it had even been given to them in the first place if they felt so unequipped to understand what it was showing um, in embryological terms. And some were... Um, other patients were much less or participants were much less concerned about understanding the details of embryo development but instead they found value in sharing their videos with friends or family or on social media so some had included moving footage of their embryos in short films that they'd made of their IVF journey um, so people really used them in ways that were meaningful and made sense to them but in these cases, patients and partners were also very aware of how having access to this imagery might invite them to form a relationship to the embryo as a potential baby. And a lot of the interviews um, involved talking through how they managed this feeling of attachment alongside feelings of hope and expectation. And of course, the very real possibility that IVF was not going to work out for them in the end. Other patients made a very conscious effort not to to look at the embryo as a potential baby and some explained how they had chosen to delete or remove the video after a failed cycle or a loss um, just to avoid having to see it again. In our research we've explored how images and videos of embryos have different meanings for different people but the videos do provide new possibilities for understanding, imagining and sharing knowledge and experiences of IVF that we think are really interesting and worthy um, to explore further. Videos of embryos are not always enjoyed or wanted, but they're not always problematic or difficult either. So we are really trying to think about, um, well, think more carefully about how, where, when and why this new type of imagery is used and shared beyond the lab. Um, and on behalf of the whole team, so Manuela, Julia and myself, um, thank you to everyone who's here this evening and we really hope that you enjoy this event. Thank you Josie, it's so important to think about how different people 
react so differently and the emotional impact differs as as you've heard from from person to person so really interesting we're now going to go directly into the next presentation which is by tabitha moses an artist who's going to be talking about the visualization of pregnancy and a very personal account of her experience of pregnancy and loss so welcome tabitha hello Thank you, Natalie. I also had IVF and made artwork about the experience. After the experience, during the experience, I, it just didn't, it wasn't happening. I, I didn't want to make artwork about it, but it was the great way to process what had been going on um, for the previous few years. Once I did find out I was pregnant, actually, it was a bit before. So I thought I'd talk to you about the experience of seeing the pregnancy as it went along and then um, show you a couple of pieces of work I made about the visualization of the pregnancy. I've had two miscarriages and a, and a successful pregnancy with two unsuccessful IVFs and one successful one. And I've got to say within each pregnancy, the experience of seeing the blue line of pregnancy, then the image of the cluster of cells at embryo transfer, and then the early scans, because it was IVF, we had early scans and then the later scans and also that time lapse video. We had that in our in the successful pregnancy. The experience of seeing all those is quite different with the successful and with the unsuccessful pregnancies. With the successful pregnancy, even right from the beginning where the blue line showed up, there was astonishment and disbelief um, seeing the, the blue line. Um, I didn't didn't trust that it was true um, and with the early scans each time we went for a scan I think we had about three early scans each time we went I just expected to find no heartbeat and was just astonished each time that there was a heartbeat but still couldn't quite um, didn't trust that this was actually going to happen um, so this was after after two unsuccessful IVFs and a miscarriage with a, a natural conception. Even at the 12-week scan, I didn't trust that it was going to carry on. I was asking myself, dare I love this thing that's growing inside me? Because if I start to love it and then I lose it, it would be as just as heartbreaking anyway. I just couldn't dare love it until I actually felt it moving, until the quickening. That was the moment that I actually trusted this pregnancy was going to result in a baby the images didn't really mean so much to me yet at the same time each image brings you at each step of the way it brings you one step closer to the that precious gift of the baby and I did share it share each image including the blue line at the beginning with friends and family um, close friends and family the uh, of course there was a whatsapp group so there was this dichotomy of not trusting the image, but at the same time thinking, oh, this is bringing me closer to the prize. And that brings me to, it, I think the, it resonates there with Isabel's work, because when I think back to that, the way I was thinking, and I just did not trust the images, but I did trust the feeling. I can imagine that in the days before we had scans and those that technology that could tell us what was going on inside our bodies, it wasn't until the quickening that you would actually know for sure that you'd be pregnant. So I'd be, I'm really interested to know, to hear your talk, Isabel, and that, that, that sense of, am I or aren't I pregnant? Where the breath is held and you're neither in one state or the other. But when I had a miscarriage and it was at a scan that I saw there was no heartbeat after some bleeding. So we did have an idea that this wasn't going to show a live fetus. There was definitely a lot of magical thinking going on there. And each time I went for a scan afterwards to confirm that it wasn't alive, I would be just hoping against hope that they'd made a mistake, that this time the scan would show a heartbeat. Surely these things happen and... Um, again holding my breath and then seeing you know it was confirmed after those subsequent scans and still again then trust trusting that the pregnancy really was over only came with the evidence of the actual the bloody miscarriage when it actually happened so that again um trusting what my body was telling me rather than what the image was telling me so uh, there's a four cell embryo. The embryo imaging, I feel, contributes to this illusion of control. So one of the pieces of work I made about the pregnancies was in vitro. And this was based on when we had the embryo transfer. 
and you could see the embryos, the two embryos on a screen, and they looked like heavenly bodies just um, floating in space. So I made these two light boxes of the a foot, two four cell embryos, and this one is the two eight cell embryos from the second uh, round of IVF. And around them, so it's card pricked with the syringe actually that I used to deliver the IVF drugs and it's pricked to make the shapes of the embryos and then to make the clusters of the constellations of stars that would have been in the night sky at the time that we had IVF. And there's a close-up of the night sky and the card and it was just happenstance that the um, the syringe was the perfect thing to prick the card with. But I like quite like that the link again about pricking because this this idea of pricking runs through me work and the pricking of the surface which brings me back to the pricking of the surface of the skin at the time that we were having the second unsuccessful IVF I was making this piece of work and I thought it was about the skin as a threshold between the mind and the body but actually there was a lot of pins and pricks in it and in Rebecca Bailey's essay she wrote that it was about the psychic pain of the body that's um, the disobedient body and which really uh, I realized then that it was actually about the IVF and and the, all those injections I'd been having given myself uh, uh, fed into this work and then most recently I made work called investment where again pricking the surface of the fabric made hospital gowns and embroidered them one for this woman called Melanie who'd had IVF at the Hewitt Facility Centre at Liverpool Women's Hospital and then a gown for me and a gown for another woman called Emma and it was important that our blastocysts and embryos were all represented in the embroidery so you can see in the centre of Melanie's gown there the actual that embroidery is the image is taken from the actual picture of the blastocyst that she just had transferred when we first met it was unfortunately unsuccessful and she, he, she is photographed in the gown back at the Hewitt Centre just a couple of weeks after finding out that the cycle of IVF was unsuccessful. And then all around the edge are the white ones are the, the uh, frozen embryos she had in the, in the freezer at the clinic. One of those has subsequently become uh, a baby this year. So congratulations, Melanie. So at the centre of each of our gowns is the thing that was like most important to us. And this is mine. That was me photographed back in the Hewitt Centre. And these are reproduced as big photographs. Actually, you can see them on the behind me in the studio here. And this was mine. And right in the centre of my gown is the donated egg because our third IVF was um, we used a donated egg and it resulted in um, a baby. And so the, the donated egg was the most important thing for me there. And you can see the sperm all trying to get in and the little ginger sperm that finally made it. And then you can see the, the failed embryos at the top. Um, uh, yeah, and it was important to, to show those images of the embryos. So yeah, I'll leave you with that. And I, I'm looking forward to hearing the other speakers' ideas on the same subject. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Tabitha. Great news about Melanie. I love, I love that embroidery. It looks amazing. Thank you. Before okay. we introduce our next speaker would like you to fill in another question have you ever seen a video of embryo development shared or received a picture of pregnancy or ultrasound taken pictures of someone you know during fertility treatment or pregnancy made art in relation to your reproductive experience or seen a picture or a drawing of a non-pregnant uterus number of you have seen a video of embryo development and obviously so far we've heard from Josie and Tabitha in terms of feelings around seeing this imagery. Tabitha was talking about making the artwork relating to her embryos and the blastocysts so yeah, a number of you have shared or received a picture of pregnancy ultrasound. All right so our next speaker is Dr Isabel Davis from Birkbeck University and Isabel will be discussing the histories of unpregnancy where you aren't but you might be and how people in the past how they imagine the empty womb or a failing pregnancy and whether it is possible to see a pregnancy not happening so over to you and welcome Isabel thank you everybody so today I want to talk about imaging and imagining pregnancy in the absence of pregnancy so the very powerful impression of feeling like you're pregnant when you're not 
So if you Google feeling pregnant every month or something similar, you'll likely pull some results like this that testify to the repetitive experience of imagining oneself pregnant, especially in the two week wait between ovulation or embryo transfer and a pregnancy test. So what do, what do we offer women in terms of an understanding of the relationship between mind and body when they're trying and hoping and trying and waiting? So every trying to conceive woman will have heard and been irritated by the folk advice that they should stop worrying and it will happen. Advice which we rarely interrogate, but which holds within it the extraordinary assumption that desire and hope directly inhibit the workings of the womb, do they? And now here, on the other hand, is some more official advice. My doctor said the exam and pregnancy test showed I wasn't pregnant, but I really feel I am. The answer to that question from what to expect when you're expecting assumes that it arises only in the case of a false negative. As remarkable as modern medical science is, it says, when it comes to pregnancy diagnosis, it still sometimes takes a back seat to women's intuition. The accuracy of the different pregnancy tests varies, and many do not indicate pregnancy as early as some women begin to feel that they are pregnant, which is sometimes within a few days after conception, which is all very well if you're right. Or what about this? Uh, what to do in the two week wait after IVF from Zeta West's plan to get pregnant. In amongst the advice about nutrition, rest and drinking plenty of water is this quite extraordinary piece of advice to visualize the embryo embedding in your uterus. Is any of this advice any good? What does it help us with? What ideas about mind and body is it based on? I'm a cultural historian and I've been asking what did people in the past think about this problem before pregnancy testing and sonography? After all, they experienced the diagnostic ambiguity in a more prolonged way. Rather than thinking about picturing the womb then, today I'm going to be talking about um, uh, how far the womb itself is a picturing device and how we picture the idea of being pregnant uh, and make that quite a powerful um, uh, experience of symptoms. I'm going to take you to the middle of the 17th century and the work on generation by the natural philosopher William Harvey, who's better known for his discoveries about the circulation of the blood and the function of the heart. Now, he tried really hard to see what was going on inside the mammalian womb in the two week wait. Of course, he didn't call it that, but he was looking for the very earliest sign of conception after sex. So Harvey was dissecting animal cadavers, often deer, at different points between mating and pregnancy. And he was working without the benefit of a microscope, although that technology was just available. And he found that there was a gap of, interestingly enough, about two weeks um, between mating when the fluid sperm could be seen within a recently mated animal body and later the appearance of an embryo which was possible to see with the naked eye. The sperm did not, he thought, even travel as far as the uterus. So sperm, he concluded, didn't work through physical contact, but instead at a remove perhaps, he suggested, like a magnet without touching the ovum. Now, historians of science and reproduction have called this out as an error. Sperm does have to make material contact with the ovum. That meeting can only be seen under a microscope, though, so he dismissed it. And they've also dismissed his further speculations. So as well as suggesting the analogy of a magnet, Harvey wondered if the uterus did something rather like the brain did. And to think about this, Tabitha and Liv, he thought about the brain of the artist. So the artist sees something in the world, bring it into their mind through sight, an idea which they think about to produce a work of art. What if, he asked, the womb brought sperm into itself, rather like an idea, doing something akin to an artist's brain, thinking in order to produce an image? So both brain and uterus can conceive of things, ideas and offspring. And Harvey notes the coincidence that that word conceive and 
concept or conceptus, you know, the co coincidence that that word is used both for fetuses and ideas. Now, historians have described this analogy between the brain and the uterus as failed and ludicrous, I'm using their words, based on nothing more than the coincidence of words. And there's also been disappointment that Harvey, who was so proto-modern in his work on blood, was so off-beam on this point. But let me play counsel for Harvey's defence. Now, the inside of the working uterus can still not be seen outside of the clinic. I can't dissect myself like one of Harvey's deer and use the microscope technology that he overlooked. And in that respect, the two-week wake is rather like the gap described by William Harvey nearly 400 years ago. At those moments in time when pregnancy tests are of no use, I'm in the same position as women who lived before their invention. Like Harvey, I'm trying to use my own eyes, my own senses, assessing internal sensations, resorting to the old technologies of the clock, the calendar and the thermometer. Even within the clinic, there are limits to our sight lines. This is the blogger Little Red Hen on her embryo transfer. I watched the monitor next to the bed as the doctor dropped it into me and it floated gracefully down in the blackness, a glowing white dot that finally nestled into the bottom and disappeared from view. So this is a new horizon beyond which we cannot see. So this patient has now got two weeks to wait before a pregnancy test is valid and longer still for sonography to tell her if a pregnancy is viable. So she's on her own then, imagining. Now, one historian has suggested that Harvey's notion of the brain-like uterus is another way of describing hysteria, a diagnosis which, as you know, has done cultural violence to women over centuries. But when Harvey talks about hysteria elsewhere in his work, he understands that to be different, a pathology which afflicts particularly young unmarried girls, unable to consummate their desires. His idea of the thinking uterus is different and it fits into a wider idea in Harvey's world that the body and mind are interlocked, even that bodies of women, but also men, were intelligent. Harvey is talking about the uterus because that's his topic, but he understood that other organs too that are beneath consciousness, part of what we would call the autonomic nervous system, like the heart or the digestive functions, could be influenced by conscious thought in all sorts of odd ways. Another historian has scoffed that if Harvey were right, then women would be able to get pregnant just by thinking about it. We wish. However, um, Harvey is clear that conceptions happen after sex, so he's talking about the expectations that a sexual life generates, rather than a magical ability to make something out of nothing. But more, most important of all, in my view, historians have missed the fact that Harvey is not only talking about pregnancy, he begins his unusual speculations by thinking about false pregnancy. He notices that particularly in animals that they can exhibit symptoms after mating, although an embryo hasn't developed. And I think for reasons I haven't time to go into here that he's talking from personal experience of false pregnancy within his own childless marriage. So Harvey is thinking then not about generation, but about non-generation. And for that subject, his error about how exactly sperm influences the ovum is less serious because immateriality is much more relevant. So I'm just going to finally say, what could we take away from Harvey's work to think about? We might discuss whether we think these things are useful. First of all, he tells us that not getting pregnant is not a pathology and a very normal outcome of trying to conceive is of nothing happening at all. So our books are what we might call teleological. That happens and this happens and that as if we were reproductive machines. Now, secondly, he tells us that sex generates expectations which can create biologically demonstrative effects in the body including in the uterus, an organ that we usually think of as out of reach of conscious thought like the heart or the gut. And this too, for him, is not an illness or a disorder, but a reasonably ordinary aspect of a sexual life. And as an, a, an aside, we do know that expectation can, can influence in the placebo response. Um, thirdly, that we may be seasonally prone to reproductive image making, rather as birds grow broody in springtime. Humans have seasons when uteruses are more brain-like and prone to conceiving of things than others.
And finally, that strong misleading impressions of pregnancy are conceptions, but conceptions without a fetus. And Harvey says he knows this because of the presence of pregnancy symptoms and signs and maternity and maternal behaviours. And so he's determined to credit women's feelings and the instinctual behaviours of female animals to validate their fertile imaginings and to include them in his picture of the biology of fertility, whatever their reproductive outcomes. Thank you. Fascinating stuff. And you can hear more uh, about Isabel and her work in the previous podcast that I have done. So you can do that when you subscribe. Yep. We will be talking more about what Isabel has been discussing. We also need to ban Googling when you're feeling vulnerable at certain times of the month. Our next speaker is Lee Pennington, who's an artist and a PhD student at UCA, who's going to be introducing her artwork, Private View, which explains the two parts of Lee's show, which is all focused around pregnancy tests, of which I will hand over to Liv to explain more. So welcome. Good evening, Liv. Good evening. So it's quite strange not seeing all of you. In 2002, when the private view um was made for the first time I was actively not trying to get pregnant um but I was beginning to think about how I would become a mum um and how how do you maintain a career how does having a child and kind of speculating on futures and the futures that I could have but I also was looking at how art worked so I would have to say in the in the very beginning of this performance I was probably more focused on telling stories and making stories happen then I was really really truly believing that pregnancy would be part of the performance so to kind of explain what happened I on the night of a private view I asked every woman who came to use the toilet at the exhibition if they would mind taking a pregnancy test and letting the results relay live above the bar so to kind of explain how that happened technically is that it was completely depersonalized and anonymous I built a box out of a CCTV camera and loads of cabling. So in 2002, it's kind of remembering back to the technology that was available. Um, at that point, mobile phones were kind of around, but they didn't have cameras on. Um, the camera phones that did exist were just being trialled. There was no Facebook. There was no Instagram. So kind of sharing intimate stories would have been in person. You would have handed the people the paper. You may have emailed um, somebody, but even emailing wasn't sort of an everyday or instant what I thought was going to happen was very different to what happened on the night and so the performance itself I just wanted the backdrop of the bar of the social event to kind of update very quietly there was no sound so that it was the kind of talking in the bar it was the speculation and just generally kind of sharing of stories in the toilet it was very very different it became incredibly chatty people really being kind of intimate and telling sharing stories that, of kind of past losses of um, kind of the hopes that they would be pregnant at the time also the research into the kind of type of pregnancy test that I would want to use um, that became quite political and I did settle on the clear view blue line because there was it's this kind of strange thing about timing for a performance or for a spectacle you need it to go slower so there is some kind of screen time whereas when you're taking the pregnancy test you want the time to go as fast as possible so you have a result but in that kind of 60 seconds you've already speculated on your future you you may have already tried to work out childcare. you may have tried to move house you've organized and reshuffled all these kind of future things that might come into play but while that's happening all these people in the bar or in the gallery are really not taking any difference it's that kind of that experience of something so personal and monumental meaning absolutely nothing in that moment to maybe hundreds of others and how we kind of share and communicate that kind of information across the bar i made coasters and postcards um so that people could kind of pick up the information about how pregnancy tests work there was quite a few people who didn't know um, or hadn't taken pregnancy tests before the performance itself i've done i did three times in 2002 so once in london once in france and once in norway I was in a very safe environment. The, the three performances took place in kind of art events. So they were kind of um, artists want to be involved in stuff, are kind of willing to take risks. Um, the pregnancy tests were almost sponsored by Unilever. Um, the brand manager thought it was a great idea. And then two weeks before the performance, the lawyers got involved and asked, um, were kind of explained that they couldn't take, that I couldn't have their pregnancy tests, that they were worried about being... Um, liable for emotional trauma um, and that they would, they would give me 500 pound instead to go buy pregnancy tests because they kind of had offered to support me but they just didn't want to give me their product 
on that night in London, 45 women took part, five were pregnant, three knew that they were pregnant, one thought they were pregnant, and there was one surprise. All the pregnancy tests were numbered, um, so the women could come back and have a look and double check their results. In France, um, it was different. It was in a nightclub at an event. Men and women were using the same toilets. And after a while, men wanted to be involved. They wanted to take part. They wanted to take the pregnancy tests. And it was a unisex environment. So I was like, if you want to take part, the kind of stories are very different. That's going to come on screen. What happened then was a rumour started that if you had a positive pregnancy test as a man, it was a first sign or an early indicator of testicular cancer. So what was for women kind of a speculation on life or speculation on potential became very, very different for the men. And they were very less willing to participate. Initially, it had been fun and something blasé that they could kind of take or leave. Now, you know, the consequences were very different. In Norway, out of the 27 people who took part, there was no pregnancies, no surprise pregnancies. In France, there was one. And in Norway, it was done as the breaking of the ground for the opera house. And I had my own portable. So I think people kind of took part to kind of circumvent different cues. Out of the first set of babies, one baby didn't make it. And that kind of led me to not actually print the photos for four years, to try and work out how to deal with the images that are generated. At the time, it was about the performance. It wasn't about the photos. And I hadn't really kind of worked out what they were meant to be. But I knew that they were important and I knew that I should photograph them. And I had asked women and the participants while they were in the queue if they could um, just give me a little kind of clip about how they felt about it while queuing. In terms of people, in terms of technology, there is no images from France or Norway. And that is purely about technology. In 2002, these ones were shot on a 5.4 camera and on film. Digital cameras were incredibly expensive. So a digital back at that time was £22,000 for a 5.4 camera. I didn't have access to that kind of technology. So when I went to Norway and France to do the performances, I took cameras and I tried shooting in daylight and the negatives were just too thin. So they were unprintable. So only the stories on film exist from London. So then spring forward to 2019, I was asked if I'd mind redoing the performance. And I have to say in the, between 2002 and 2019, I've had three children. And the idea of doing this performance again, the kind of, the hugeness of asking people to participate had changed. I was quite blasé in 2002, maybe not as considerate of the ethics as I could have been. In 2019, it was very different. And also kind of things like GDPR and the kind of how we do data collection and how we hold on to people's information has changed. So the kind of whole technical setup, that was really interesting, that the kind of systems in place for kind of keeping information. Also what had happened is the kind of digitalization of pregnancy tests, trying to find a pregnancy test that wasn't text-based, that wasn't too fast. So I had to find a very slow performing or a slower performing pregnancy test so that it would appear on screen. Kind of other noticeable differences between 2002 and 2019 is that people are much used to, uh, much more used to sharing, possibly because of social media and just firing off kind of tweets. But the text responses became bigger. And as you can see from this slide, there was a lot of sharing. And the other thing that kind of snuck in was emojis. So out of pregnancy tests that were done in 2019, five, I think there's four or five kind of texts with emojis. So in terms of how these look, it's handwritten on paper and I transcribe it. And I, I do it with the spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes, as close to, but equally try and standardise it. So for me, what became apparent from the pregnancy test images together is no matter how you try and standardise something, there's always quirks. And I find something incredibly beautiful in the fact that we cannot standardise fully, that there is a slight kind of colour or discoloration. There is kind of maybe a bacterial infection that shows up in a different way. So they become portraits and really kind of, um, I've described them before as kind of chemical portraits. They're a kind of an indication of the health of the person at that time, potentially. So this person here, could be pregnant, they have a part, partner, they don't want to be, and probably not. So you kind of get this myth, this brilliant kind of hesitation of speculation. And that's what I kind of think now think of pregnancy, taking a pregnancy test as doing, is it gives you the kind of capacity to time travel and, and world build, because you are speculating on something and you travel very far away from your body very quickly. And this person would like to be pregnant, but aren't. And there's those kind of stories um, that in the 2002, I hadn't considered happening but very much more in 2019. So my interest in um, standardisation, perfection, 
carried on. And so the next piece of work after the pregnancy tests was a series of portraits of chicken eggs, um, a dozen rejected eggs. They're all eggs that happen naturally in a life cycle of a chicken. So they're kind of puberty and menopause. And as the body kind of of the hen changes or kind of um, lacks magnesium, the shell starts disappearing. Um, the super giant egg, um, number four on the top row, is kind of twins. It's um, a chicken learning how to lay eggs. It's a chicken going through puberty. Um, and all these eggs are fit for human consumption in terms of, but what they aren't is aesthetically pleasing. And to the top left, which is a white egg, is not acceptable in England. But in Europe, you're very much more used to white eggs. So all these eggs, which do not fit the standard, are kind of left to the side and become kind of used for other materials, like cakes or kind of industrial baking. So I was very I'm interested to talk to um, the fellow panel about the idea of standards and perfection in embryo development and how that might kind of impact. So that is my talk. I hope I haven't spoken too fast and thank you. We're going to move on to our last speaker, Professor Nick Hopwood from the University of Cambridge. And Nick is going to be outlining how since the 18th century, the images that we see that associate are associated with pregnancy have progressed. So welcome, Nick. Thanks very much, Natalie. As we have already seen, uh, images of human embryos and fetuses loom large among visions of reproduction. It's common now to see them in classrooms, clinics and art galleries and on pregnancy apps. Sometimes through debates about Darwinism, abortion and experimentation, they've been controversial, but they're also routine. People take them for granted as showing how we all started out. Now, this is recent in historical terms. Only 250 years ago, developing human embryos were still nowhere to be seen. And then, during the 19th century, anatomists collaborated with artists and doctors, and through them also with women patients, to produce developmental series of images representing progressively more advanced embryos and fetuses. During the 20th century, wide audiences came to see these series as standing for the course of a pregnancy. Now, in surveying that history this evening, I'd like to highlight change since the 1960s, from anatomists presenting dead preparations to the viewing of living embryos and fetuses that could develop into babies. And I'll propose two linked topics for discussion. The first, practices of selection by normality, sex, and race. The second, I'll note how developmental series represent reproductive success. That's the narrative that several of my fellow panelists have in effect already been working against. So I hope that this is going to uh, complement uh, what they've said. Now, the earliest developmental series of human embryos and fetuses were anatomical studies of preparations obtained with a lot of difficulty in medical encounters. Samuel Thomas Zemmering's Images of Human Embryos of 1799 are generally regarded as the first. Physicians and surgeons collected material in encounters with aborting or miscarrying women. Anatomists took clumps in blood, which the women had understood in terms of illness, waste material, or wanted children, and interpreted them as precious embryos. They arranged them in order as best they could, they made drawings and later also waxed models. They published and displayed the results. In the early 20th century, gynecological operations provided fresher, earlier preparations for anatomical study. The Center of Human Embryology, now not in Germany, but at the Carnegie Department in Baltimore in the United States, produced ever more detailed drawings and models. This is a particularly detailed a uh, particularly fine model seen in, in four different views. The researchers there set up a standard staging system. And between the 1930s and the 1950s, they finally obtained specimens representing the first two weeks of development from women scheduled for hysterectomies. They increased the chance of finding something by asking the patients to have sex on a specific day before the operation. This was not controversial at the time, or not openly so, but it did become controversial later. They preserved what they'd found for drawing and photography. But that was still anatomy. New images start to arrive in the 1960s. 
And most of you will have seen the colour photographs by the Swedish photographer Lennart Nielsen. They're mostly of fetuses dead or dying in tanks of saline solution, but were transformed into images of life and helped the public fetus become a political actor in the abortion wars. More profound change came from two technologies for seeing embryos and fetuses while still alive. First, the visualization of a fetal patient, especially but not only by ultrasound. This very early uh, 2D sonogram is difficult to interpret, but I expect you've all seen easier ones. Like hormonal tests, the routinization of ultrasound scans in the 1980s accelerated the experience of pregnancy. It reduced the importance of birth in recognizing a new individual. The second technology was in vitro fertilization. Now, this is the same embryo as we've seen before. That's how important these uh, standard canonical images are. The IVF pioneer Robert Edwards said in 1978, after the birth of the first so-called test tube baby, the last time I saw her, she was just eight cells in a test tube. She was beautiful then, and she's still beautiful now. As fertility clinics opened, again through the 1980s, many more people shared that experience of seeing potential children in a dish. Fetuses seen by ultrasound usually would develop into healthy babies. Embryos seen in vitro often would not implant, but would-be parents have invested both kinds of image with hope and sometimes fear. And both have been very publicly displayed. Now, the images I've been showing were highly selected, and I'd like to say a little bit about selection. It's an important theme more generally in the history of reproduction. Think about eugenics, about selective breeding. And selection is going on even here in these pictures where it may not be immediately obvious. 19th century anatomists suspected their material of abnormality because it mostly came from miscarriages. These are the last two rows of the Zimmering plate that I showed near the beginning. He sought what he called the most perfect, the most beautiful embryos as norms. He was also interested in normal variation, not least by sex and race. Now, Zimmering's series is mixed by sex. Uh, I've put the, uh, the sexes on here. And, and almost all of the series are mixed in this way, but he was especially on the lookout for beautiful girls. He wrote, does the clear brow of the 17th girl, so that's the last one on this slide, not already show a certain innate friendliness? She was his favorite. He praised the grace of the very lovely face, the beauty of the really full trunk, and the elegant proportions of the excellent limbs. European anatomists mostly knew or assumed that their material was Caucasian. But in the early to mid 20th century, embryologists at the Carnegie department began a project in what they called racial embryology. This is one of their record cards on which the so-called nationality of the mother is given in the language of the time as Negro. But the project didn't come to much. Carnegie stages abstract from race and sex. Ultrasound screening made selection more urgent. Occasionally, a person or a couple comes in to see a picture of a baby and the sonographer or doctor notices something worrying often based on a computer using algorithms to compare on-screen measurements with vast amounts of data. You can see that here for nuchal transparency, a risk mask marker for Down syndrome. There may then be a difficult decision about whether or not to terminate the pregnancy. But the algorithms used to measure intrauterine growth are not neutral. It, it's hotly debated whether they should be universal for all countries or customized for different ethnic groups within them. In patriarchal societies, sex selection is also a major issue and not because like Zimmering, parents want beautiful girls. In IVF, the main issue for selection is raising the success rate of an implantation. So this, as we've already heard, is a grade one embryo. Clinical embryologists find it hard to tell which embryos are more likely to develop, to develop normally. Uh, and for a long time, the main, main criterion has been beauty which does echo Zermering. Uh, and being grade one means that it's, it's particularly symmetrical, but provided they look more or less okay, there hasn't been so much evidence that this really makes a difference. The time-lapse videos that Josie talked about are an attempt to generate better results by taking a more dynamic view. But as we heard, not everyone agrees with that. Now, the series I've been showing represent development to more advanced stages. They display reproductive success. 
And that's remarkable when you realize that each of the preparations that appears to be developing into the next stage, in fact, represents a pregnancy cut short. And these images are highly selected themselves. The anatomist who made this one discarded many preparations as more or less abnormal. At the Carnegie department, they found that 38% among those early embryos that they obtained from the timed operations were not normal either. And yet embryos appear overwhelmingly as part of series representing normality and reproductive success. Obstetric textbooks have often been criticized for dwelling on what can go wrong, but advice books try not to worry people unduly, and critiques of the pathologization of pregnancy have emphasized that. Now, this has become increasingly problematic in view of the historically novel prominence of experiences of miscarriage and the high failure rates of infertility treatment, perhaps heightened by the greater intrusiveness of ultrasound and of uh, especially pregnancy apps, which, as many will know, liken the weekly growth of the embryo and fetus to the supermarket fruit and veg that pregnant people are encouraged to eat. By contrast, artists have for decades now reflected on reproductive selection and on those embryos that are not chosen for implantation in fertility clinics. Helen Chadwick pioneered this in 1995. But also in more educational contexts, it seems that it might be empowering to have some images that start, say, with 10 fertilized eggs and follow each of them to what will be a wide range of different outcomes. So I've talked about how when living embryos and fetuses started to be imaged in and around clinical settings in which they could go on to become babies, it raised the stakes for these visions of reproduction. But there are continuities from the period when embryos and fetuses were mostly seen as dead preparations. For all the differences, issues of selection echo from the 19th to the 21st century. The focus on representing reproductive success is also a long-term theme. Perhaps it's time for more images that take a different approach. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everybody. I mean, I can see it's very apparent that all the different presentations and individual works highlight the many different ways in which we can analyze and look at imaging in reproduction. So I'm gonna ask all the speakers to please turn your cameras on. There's definitely common questions. Do, does anyone want to start in making some observations about common topics or threads? Because Liv, you raised a point before, just as you were finishing, as I threw you off guard. About the um, uh, perfection and standardising and how that kind of plays out medically. Nick did mention that in terms of selection. So I'm just yeah, quite interested in the quest for standardisation never seems to really work. Or that maybe that's just my interpretation of it. There is always still space for individualisation and it just quirks, really. Well, a lot of effort ha has been put into trying to set up standards of normality and of course they have been useful in in lots of ways um, but it's also it was difficult in the 19th century because uh, the anatomists themselves didn't really trust the material that they had and it's difficult uh, on a population basis for example now to be sure which are, which are the right standards to be using and there are dangers of false positives and, and false negatives as, as well as as a lot of us have been saying, uh, creating an expectation of, of perfection and that everything is going to go according to, to one plan. The bit that I found exciting about making the artwork with the, the, the 40 kind of the gridded it was that they were so incredibly different. And I think that for me was kind of quite beautiful in terms of it became the 40 personal stories kind of shone through very quickly. Um, you know, in, in without any ma major detail, I suppose. That's what I, I mean. I, I love the fact that when things just go slightly awry. Isabel, you wanted to add something. Yes, I mean, I think we're, we're all sort of wondering about this question about how how um, the experience, a slightly more chaotic experience of um, reproduction might be presented. You know, that we're, we're very used to seeing sort of adverts which show this kind of, you know, you, you get married, you have children, you buy a house, you know, you deal with these things in the right order. You know, and I think we're all talking about the fact that there can be a more, um, you know, there's a much more variable set of outcomes and how that can be imaged and, um, you know, why, you know, and, and making sure that people's experience of miscarriage, the first experience of miscarriage isn't their own, that there's a bit more of a, 
a, a sense in which uh, I don't I don't want to say unsuccess exactly exactly, but uh, these sort of varied outcomes might be presented, and so so hearing people talk about this you know this movement through to success and you know is um you know in Nick's talk and so on I think there's something really interesting there about how we could change that narrative there was quite an interesting conversation within the kind of trying to conceive community on Instagram towards one of the main providers of pregnancy tests saying that you know all the adverts are about a couple together being really happy with a positive and never showing a couple together getting that negative in any of the adverts for pregnancy tests and the same with the sort of boxes for uh, vitamin tablets and so on you know this kind of you know yeah you you have them arranged in the, on the shelf like this well first of all there's the conception ones and then there's the you know the new mum ones and so on and it's very it goes in a in a pattern like that tabitha live Coming back to that that idea of standards as well, and the um, the visual beauty of that grid where every test is the same but different, and you can see that even the sh- slight pink tones and yellow tones of the the grounds and the, each line is different. It really reminds me of when I was taking a pregnancy test, and I really what in twenty fourteen the last one I took it was well not the last one but anyway it was re- I really wanted a sort of an analog test I didn't want one of those digital tests where it just says in standard writing yes or no or pregnant or not pregnant there's a real beauty in that that analog chemical process that appears before your eyes a magic because I think in 2002 there was a lot more that were red there was definitely a pregnancy test that was a red minus and a red plus and that felt horrible I mean that felt you know that you can confer that kind of symbolism without really you know one person's positive isn't a positive and vice versa so it was quite interesting the kind of the politics of symbols in those and how to kind of create emotional distance so people can kind of feel the space themselves. But the digital pregnancy tests have just come into more trouble recently as well, haven't they? In terms of environmentally and ecologically unfriendly, um, in terms of that they're actually just readers. They're not. Um, it's just that yeah, the screens are just re- read, and so there's a little one-time use battery inside. So maybe kind of old school kind of chemical analog is the way forward. Nick, you've got something to add. I wanted to pick up a slightly different point, if that's okay. I was particularly interested um, the way that uh, Tabitha raised the uh, the importance of quickening, and in a sense, it it wasn't those uh, visual experiences that really really resonated, um, and that. That echoes some of the things that uh, uh, informants said to Lisa Mitchell in her uh, ethnography of, of ultrasound in, in Montreal in the early 90s. That, uh, women, some women there said, uh, no, it was, it, it was actually feeling, uh, feeling the fetus inside, not, 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 not seeing it. So, so I, I thought that it was interesting to think about that also in relation to the experiences that Josie described with uh you know what people made of their of their videos um where i was wondering how much you'd looked at uh what prior experiences of of embryos and fetuses of, of seeing them that those clients had josie do you want to oh yes there i am sorry okay. <laughs> yeah it's with the, the quickening it's hard because there was one of the real things that we found is that a lot of people weren't actually expecting to see these videos so it was a bit of a surprise and people wanted to place them within this kind of because people are very familiar with ultrasounds of fetuses so quite a lot of the people I talked to had actually made stills from their videos to turn it into a kind of imagery that they were more um, more familiar with and make it fit into a kind of narrative that they um, new from sort of seeing ultrasounds or being exposed to those in all sorts of different places, adverts and everywhere. And in terms of prior experience of, I think people were very hesitant. I guess that is the main thing. It's it's this tentative uh, feeling of being possibly pregnant, but not really. And, and wait, or that experience of waiting as well, always waiting to get to the next stage and uh, always feeling that something might happen and we're led to sort of see pregnancy and especially the early pregnancy as a very risky time so it's those those experiences of not quite knowing what to feel I guess really came 
came out in the interviews that I did. And the language as well is is interesting, not really knowing um, at very, very early stages whether you can talk about a loss or a miscarriage. How, how do you actually define what happens at those very early stages, potentially between a transfer and doing the pregnancy test after the the two-week wait usually so so that was a really interesting time in the interviews a very difficult time I guess for the patients that I interviewed that that emerged very clearly especially when people probably weren't have told people what's going on because there's still such a secrecy about having surgery treatment and I just want to ask the speakers because you have been reflecting upon visualizations of process and we talk about kind of how it, it speculates about reproductive present and future. There was conversations about, we've talked about time and future planning. And your presentation seems to suggest that making and experiencing images of reproduction does blur or challenge people's understanding of what that image represents in terms of present or future. Can, can you talk a bit more about that, maybe Isabel or Nick? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think um, this is one of the things about trying to conceive that people put- like repeatedly um you know they, they repeatedly imagine new futures which that which then they have to reconstruct all the time it's very tiring um you know to be thinking thinking that through constantly and i spe- suppose especially now for women you know when they're working and and trying to think about how not to land their colleagues and things and so you know with every round of ivf or every cycle you think well you know this would make this that this time would collapse and I'd be holding a baby in the summer and you know constantly thinking about that I mean I think one of the things that's quite interesting about the Harvey stuff is he does try to think about seasonality in that respect tries to you know I notice there's a question in the chat about um, the relationship between humans and animals and he thinks a lot about how our time frame we think about ourselves as outside of natural time and outside of seasons Um, but he asks maybe you know humans have a season like animals maybe they you know and and there's there's something interesting about that I think which I think is worth thinking about like we're we're just starting to learn about the the ways we're much more connected than we thought to the, the the environment and what we do affects the planet and vice versa and perhaps we need to, you know, think about how that could, those kinds of thoughts can work in our own time. Thinking about, well, maybe humans do have seasons. <laughs> maybe that, maybe that's true. Anybody else want to add anything before I move on to another question? Well, I could come in on on that question just to say that although I didn't talk about them, some of the most important uh, images of human embryos historically have been ones that compare them to uh, the embryos of other mammals and other vertebrates and uh, in the context of the theory of evolution. And that perhaps doesn't seem uh, so controversial outside creationist circles today, but uh, uh, the... Um, presenting uh, just how similar the uh, human embryo and a dog embryo or a chick embryo could look um, at early stages. That that was uh, exceptionally controversial in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. So, so the question about animality uh, is a very is a very important one here, um, and, and has has really exercised people a great deal. And I don't know whether Nick, you've actually seen the question, um, or whether you were just right on par there. Nora asked the question pretty much in what you just answered. That was me doing my best to say, um, from from what I know, something that would uh, in, engage with that, because um, a- absolutely it, it was it was controversial. Uh, the degrees of similarity and some of the anatomists who were involved in the work I was talking about um, themselves thought that the similarities had been overdone uh, and they they were pursuing human embryology partly to show how different how specific uh, human embryos were so 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 that's been that's been really quite an issue. I want to talk as well a little bit about how we think artwork can help individual collective understanding of reproduction obviously um, Liv and Tabitha you have you've been talking about your work and there's been a question about it actually as to why there isn't more more art 
or performance drawing on the infertility experience. And I can only say that you need to get on the radar of a brilliant event called Fertility Fest, which Tabitha, I think you've been involved and, and Isabel, that's how our paths crossed. Fertility Fest is all yeah. about this, this mixing of science, uh, modern science and um, and infertility. Um, I don't know if either uh, any, any of our speakers want to, want to comment on, on that as an experience as well. Tabitha, do you want to? Yes, yeah, yeah, I can um, reflect on that because it's a question I've asked myself as well. Why is, especially when I started making the work, why is there not more work, visual art about infertility? Um, and it feels as though it's gathering pace. And when I first started making the work in 2013, there wasn't that much I could find just on the internet and through talking with other artists and curators. And, and then I met Jessica Hepburn and Gabby Vautier of Fertility Fest. And of course, they've brought so much together, performance, literature, also all art forms. And then with each year that that happens, there seems to be more and more. And it feels like, I don't know whether it's because there's something about women artists making work about their experience and, and, and them just being a reflection of women in society generally and more people having fertility problems. So therefore, the women artists are going to be making work reflecting that part, that life, society generally. I'm sure there are lots of different reasons for it, but that's, yeah, what I'm thinking about it. Isabel, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, so many things. I mean, yeah, Fertility Fest was, was really good, I think, at bringing people together. But I do think that there's a critical mass at the moment in terms of um, thinking about... Or, or, not, not just in terms of visual art, but also memoirs, blogs, um, you know, and, and writing about um, different kinds of um, uh, reproductive outcomes and reproductive um, uh, journeys. And so, and I think that's really interesting. I wonder if it connects a bit to what Liv was talking about and the, and the, and the very real changes there have been in terms of people's space for confessional writing you know and, and the way that social media has made it more possible for people to connect up and to understand that they you know that they're not as alone as they as they thought they were I mean there really has been an explosion of material um, I suppose one of the things that has surprised me and and where where I want to go in my own work is that there isn't yet a history of trying to conceive particularly. I mean, there are more and more histories now of infertility, um, but they were sort of relatively new, they're, they're relatively new phenomenon, really before that sort of non-reproductive studies focused on contraception, particularly. Um, and there are lots of political reasons for that. But I think it's it's just interesting about the way that there seems to have been kind of phases in terms of, of what has been written. And we, we, I think it's a good, you know, it's, it's really um, an exciting time for uh, memoirists and uh, pe people um, inventing new forms for writing about this. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring you these both in, in in just one sec, just to say that when I started the Fertility Podcast, I couldn't find a British voiced podcast about it. This was six years ago. There was a few that had been, a few conversations on Women's Hour, The Guardian had done something, but I couldn't find any British voices, hence me started. And now, I mean, if you're interested in podcasts and maybe you're already listening to podcasts about fertility, there are a whole host. And so as a creative format, um, you know, even from an audio point of view, it's definitely boomed I know I've got all I've got Liv Tabitha Josie Liv do you want to just comment I can see you all don't yeah. worry sorry uh, mum was very brief um, I was wondering whether the time when when stories get told or whose stories get kind of um, visibilities maybe there's actually um, a certain um, a critical mass of women in position of commissioning power and who are now curators and who are now artistic directors and so they may not have been able to tell their stories but they can open the doors to younger generations and actually kind of commission work i'm kind of in the last year in london there's been maybe three or four different exhibitions on motherhood and and kind of maternal and from different and, and i kind of wonder if the curators are of a certain age and of a certain power so they can make that happen um so it's kind of maybe that kind of critical mass Tabitha, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I'd like to also say that how heartened I am to see that men are adding their voices more than they were as well and how the conversations opened up generally for, for people, but also particularly for men to talk about it and make work about it. And on when you were talking about um, Fertility Fest, there was um, a brilliant piece by an artist called Foz Foster 
who had done this kind of uh, scroll uh, a scroll talking about his I think he'd had five miscarriages hadn't he mm. and and like you say it, there are definitely more men speaking there was a brilliant man called Rod Silvers who did a whole piece with Radio 4 talking about his own experiences and I think there's still such stigma about it but there is definitely more of a platform that men are feeling more confident to, to speak on Josie did you want to add something um, yeah, I was just going to pick up on because um, Isabel mentioned social media, and I uh, that was I think that's a really sort of big point because um, a lot of the people I talked to, the main place where they had been exposed to to embryo imagery or ultrasound scans was on social media. That was a, when I asked people sort of where they'd seen or if they'd seen these kinds of images before. Um, a lot of people had seen if they were in IVF support groups on Facebook, for instance, people often might share um, pictures of embryos or videos on there or Instagram. And I, I mentioned um, earlier about these Instagram, these videos that some uh, people make for, about their journeys, which are incredibly advanced like really almost sort of feature film <laughs> length mini documentaries I'd, I'd call them which which often do include a lot of these images that we've been looking at today so I, I just I thought that's a really uh, important arena where where a lot of these images are actually being shared in a very sort of everyday casual way which I think is quite unique uh, to the time that that we're in probably. I was going to I was going to ask you about, you said that one of the ladies made this 40 minute video of her IVF oh, yeah. experience. Yeah, and it wasn't, so that was quite unusual, that sort of that length, but a good handful of people I can, I can remember off the top of my head that I spoke to had made shorter sort of clips that they shared um, within these support groups, which for, for a lot of people became very sort of tight knit um, and uh, sort of important for their experience and other people shared them with family and friends and things. So it did come up um, quite a bit, yeah. I've got a question here from Victoria Adkins saying, how do the speakers imagine that artificial womb technology may impact visions of reproduction? Well, well I, I could maybe say something. Of course, historians are much better with the past than the future. <laughs> so you out your um, uh, that, that's absolutely true. But um, uh, in a way, um, uh, image makers haven't waited for there actually to be uh, artificial wombs to start making images of them. So um, there have been images of uh, babies in bottles, test tube babies, literally in, a, in test tubes, um, and, uh, and, and of uh, ectogenesis, so uh, development to term outside the um, outside the the pregnant body so so in some ways in science fiction there's already quite a repertoire and I suppose if I had to predict which as I say I'm probably not very good at then I would at least say that that um, people will be drawing on some of those resources. Whilst I've got you there Nick there is another question for you why did the Carnegie collection stop this radicalization of embryos what was their aim in this? Okay I think that's probably a, a typo for for racialization, I think. I think that's probably a question about the racial embryology. Yeah, um, okay. At least I'm going to take it like, like that. And um, I mean, the answer is probably partly that it wasn't a huge part of their agenda or it didn't become one. And embryology also wasn't a particularly important field for the scientific racism that is, of course, uh, quite virulent in the middle of the 20th century so in, in a way fortunately it, it just didn't really it just didn't really take off um, and then uh, fairly soon uh, all of that uh, anatomical project uh, at the Carnegie department was rather marginalized as they moved to more physiological more biochemical and more molecular approaches so by the by the, the 1940s, that they they've really increasingly moving away from the the embryo collecting and cataloging and measuring. I've got another question here. Um, this is to the panel as a whole. How does spirituality influence the representations of pregnancy? 
this is from Apoba, who's saying, I'm thinking about this in particular reference to Eastern traditions of creation, hymns and uh, cyclic views of life. This is a really big question and so interesting. I mean, I, I don't know so much about the Eastern traditions that you refer to. And, you know, maybe we could hear from you about how you 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 think they influence um, these representations, but certainly in the sort of Judeo-Christian traditions. You know, there's such a strong influence from scriptural materials, even, you know, and that, and that has a very powerful legacy for us today. And, uh, and a lot of the medievalists, and uh, I'd say particularly the historian Catherine Park, has talked about the way that um, a kind of professional anatomy in um, Italy really emerged from these ideas, from, from devotional ideas about trying to find signs, holy signs within bodies. And she really says, you know, that one of the places to look for the, the you know, um, if, we, if we want to see where anatomy was first imagined or, or thought through in terms of looking into to the body to si find signs of life and spiritual action, it's really saints' lives, oddly. You know, the, those, those texts that we think of as quite separate from professional science and, you know, um, even different in their own time from medical writing but nonetheless they have a curiosity about finding sort of signs of life or the way that creation creator god can influence you know the the makings of the human body and so it's a fascinating topic but you know i will be really interested to hear about how different kinds of creation narratives affect um, you know, what, what we think of. But I suppose as well, we might think about Tabitha's point about magical thinking, the ways in which even without a, um, a kind of theological architecture and a sort of institutional kind of religion, that nonetheless, you know, when we don't know something that we tend to return, we, we tend to think in terms of faith and, um, you know, and, and <laughs> even the most agnostic amongst us, you know, there are times, you know, when you still feel like you might say a prayer, aren't there? Well, it's not going to hurt you. <laughs> Does any of the Ross speakers want to comment on what is what you're saying? Tabitha, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, it felt um, like it, this brings to mind the, the range of um, spiritual comfort available when you are trying to conceive or trying to keep that conception alive. I remember when I first started making that work investment, the gowns and embroidering all the objects that were uh, pertinent to each woman's uh, story. My first impetus was anger, really, because I felt like I was I'd been marketed to and there were you know fertility goddess pendants were this particular color for fertility lots of um lots of pseudo spiritual things I could spend my money on and it, it as through the making of the work I, I lost that anger and it became a more tender piece of the work but there was definitely a feeling of um, being marketed to with the, the pseudo spiritual aspect of it which is not to take away from an actual spiritual aspect. Have you heard that there are actually fertility astronomers? Wow, it doesn't surprise me. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and we know that we're talking about a vulnerable kind of population of people. Yeah, so. I, w I would definitely have consulted one. Hannah says, I'm wondering how all the speakers relate the various imagery to unwanted conception or wish the test is negative or experiences of fear rather than expectations of hope. For example, in ways visual knowledge on Excel stages supports de-individualizing embryos to think of cell piles rather than a future babies, what yes or no means or plus or ne uh, positive or negative rather than blue lines on pregnancy tests means for women hoping for not being pregnant, given also that the imagery of hope for a baby in TV ads, but never addressing hope for a negative test. We touched on this before, as opposed to a potential feeling of failure for women who hope to be pregnant but get a negative test result. Also the other way around, how could such visual knowledge or cell biologi biologized imagery help people undergoing IVF to rather not individualize in that early stage to potentially reduce the emotional impact of loss in the petri dish stage it's a great question hannah who would like to answer that tabitha 
My first reaction to that is to the very last question or point is that I don't think you can reduce the emotional impact of loss yes. in the petri dish stage. And wh wh whatever stage you're at, even if, if you want the pregnancy or if you don't want the pregnancy, as soon as you get that result, you imagine the person. Well, actually, I can't speak for everyone, but I would say I would imagine the person and it's not it's not just a bundle of cells. However, I was very lucky in the years I wasn't trying to get pregnant that I didn't fall pregnant and I probably would have had a different answer to that. And it, just to talk about the not wanting the pregnancy, a really poignant, some really poignant litter I saw was a, an empty pregnancy text, test box on the floor, on the ground next to an empty bottle of vodka. And I just thought the story of that, mm. you know, those two objects just spoke volumes which this question brought to mind. Isabel? Yeah, I think there's so so much in that question. And it's such an odd thing, isn't it, that in a, in a you know, in this experience, there might be um, one person wanting one result and one person wanting completely the opposite result. I mean, I think I think the one one answer is to say, you know, as as Julia Bueno has said in her book on miscarriage on on the brink of being, you know, she really talked you know, she, she's really talking about the way that for people who really want to have a baby, you know, just losing the prospect of trying might be a devastating thing, you know, even before an embryo is, is created, um, you know, even, so, so at any stage of loss might be devastating, but that really doesn't have an impact on what other people might want for themselves, you know, and it's, it, so it doesn't have implications for the um, abortion question really because you know we've got to accept that you know people there are there really is that situation where people might want very different things in in their lives and and so uh, you know I think um uh just it's it's very much as well what you were saying about the importance of different kinds of language um you know around uh um, whether we whether we call something when when we had the mentimeter um, thing right at the beginning about uh, uh, and thinking about Josie's point about it, what do you see in this image um, you know and I certainly think in in the experience of miscarriage you know when you're asked what, what you know how how you would like to deal with the remains of of your miscarriage you know people have very different responses there to how you know how how they feel actually about those those questions and so you know I think you just have to say there are as many different outcomes there as um as people probably and that they're all valid in the yeah the the having yeah. to have fertility treatment is a is a period of of a of, of grieving to not be able to conceive naturally there's that element and then I've worked in my coaching work with people who have miscarried and it were in a position where they didn't want they didn't think they wanted to get pregnant and then had to deal with the loss and the guilt of not thinking they wanted that and all the different kind of stages of, of the emotion. So I think there's so many different stages, but they are all valid, really kind of important to highlight. So we're almost out of time. And I want to say a huge thank you to our speakers, uh, to Dr. Josie Hamper, to Tabitha Moses. I feel like we need a round of applause. Uh, Dr. Isabel Davis, Leave Pennington and Professor Nick Hopwoods to all of you for giving us part of your Thursday evening to learn about this important topic to the Being Human Festival to the Centre for Public Engagement of the Queen Mary University for their support to the Wellcome Trust for their funding and the Department of People and Organisations of Queen's Mary University of London for hosting the project. So a big thank you to Queen Mary's University for inviting me to chair that really interesting discussion and I hope it was something that you enjoyed listening to. If you were there on the night and you've enjoyed listening to this back, I hope it's been really useful for you. And I'll, of course, keep you informed of any other fascinating projects like that that we're involved with here at the Fertility Podcast. But for now, remember, we are back on Monday the 22nd of February 
January. So make sure you're subscribed in your favourite podcast app. You can follow me at Fertility Poddy online. Kate is at Your Fertility Journey. And also don't forget, we have our closed Facebook group if you just search for The Fertility Podcast. And it's a really lovely group, a supportive group where we carry on the conversation. We invite you to pose more questions because when we come back on the 22nd of Feb, we're introducing our lovely new resident fertility doctor who's going to be answering your questions as we ask you each week to ask the expert so that's one of the places you can get in touch with us with those questions that still kind of maybe keeping you awake at night or you're fed up of trying to ask dr google and not getting the answer we want to give you a credible place to find the answers so looking forward to seeing you very soon 